With the success of Blaze of Glory under their belt, author John Ostrander and artist Leonardo Manco were hired to do a follow-up to their Western saga. It would be two years before that series was released under Marvel's Max imprint, which was their line of adult-oriented comics. For most Max titles, this means the occasional swear word or naked body. But it has also meant that more adult story elements could be addressed within the comic, like drug use or rape. Most Marvel comics are generally aimed at teenage and up audiences, but as comics have gone on, the audience has also aged up as well. Marvel still didn't want to alienate their general reader base, so the more edgy titles got slapped with a Max label. Because of this, for this episode, and most likely our next episode, Apache Skies Part 2, I am not going to be editing the swears for this episode. They aren't particularly offensive, it's kind of your standard set of swear words, I would argue, uh, but I just wanted to give a heads up for anybody who is more sensitive to that kind of language, or who is listening to this maybe with kids in the room, if that's a thing you do. Uh, just a friendly heads up, keep it in mind. Why Apache Skies was published under this imprint, I'm not 100% sure. It definitely has the same down-to-earth, serious, realistic style of writing that Blaze of Glory had, but it doesn't feel any more adult to me than that book did. But, in any case, Apache Skies was originally published in September of 2002, and it would run for a total of four issues. The first two, of which, we'll be discussing today. My name is Ben. And this is Comic Book Breakdown, episode 19.5, Apache Skies, part one. Before we get into our actual story elements, author John Ostrander repeats an old tactic from Blaze of Glory. He opens our first issue with a history lesson. This is done, once again, to ground us in reality before adding in the fictionalized events of the Marvel Universe. This makes those characters, the Marvel characters, feel more real and less fantastic, and it blends the two worlds of fiction and nonfiction together really well. So, in 1875, all of the Apaches west of the Rio Grande were ordered to move onto a reservation at San Carlos. These people were led by Goyathle, who most Anglo-Americans know as Geronimo. Goyathle escaped the authorities three separate times, and at one point, a full one-fourth of the U.S. military and 3,000 Mexican soldiers were hunting for him, and his band of 35 warriors and 110 women, children, and youths. That is reality. That's history. That happened. But in the Marvel Universe, there was one man standing between the government forces and the Apaches. This was Aloysius Kerr. His Apache name was Dazi, which we are told translates to, He Stands Alone. In the Westerns, though, he's known as the Apache Kid. Dazi is of mixed race, with an Anglo father and a Chaconan Apache mother. Caught between the two peoples, Dazi knew that there must be a way for them to live together. He fought for coexistence, and also made enemies on both sides, but he never stopped fighting for what he knew to be right. And sometimes along the way, he had allies. Counted amongst them is Johnny Bart, known better as the Rawhide Kid. They met during the Railroad Wars and quickly formed a bond that would last a lifetime and beyond. And now is when our main story starts. In 1886, after the events at Wondermint, Montana that we explored in Blaze of Glory, we find the drunk Cole Williams walking through the streets of a small town. He's got a bottle in one hand, a six-shooter in the other, and he's firing off drunk shots on a rainy day. All we know about him is his name— because a figure suddenly shouts it. Williams turns, confused, to go with his drunk. Who are you? he asks. The figure wears a large leather coat and a wide-brimmed hat. We only see them from behind, but they identify themselves as the Apache Kid. Williams doesn't believe it. The kid is dead! 
The figure agrees. Cole was one of the back-shooting sons of bitches who did it. And now, he's going to pay for it. We then shift into a classic Western standoff. For a full two pages, we see the gunmen square off, eye each other up, and then finally they draw. It almost seems to happen in slow motion. Williams only has enough time to bring his pistol down and around to aim at the kid, while the kid has to draw, aim, and fire. Even drunk, I would have thought that this would have been an easy shot for Williams. But the Apache kid's bullet passes through his shoulder and knocks him off of his feet. As Williams swears in the mud, the kid moves to stand over him. Hurt? I hope so. Williams glares upward. Why are you doing this? Who's that some bitch to you? He asks. The kid shoots Williams in the head. As they lift their pistol, we finally see the face of the Apache kid for the first time. And it's a woman. She's beautiful, with long black hair and dark eyes. She looks directly into the camera and says that she was his woman. Right off the bat, the tone and vibe of this book, whoo, it is spot on. We open with a standoff and a revenge killing. How much more classically Western can you get? Monko's artwork here is also amazing. He painted this entire series where he drew most of Blaze of Glory. As such, all of the artwork is a little bit rougher, it still looks dirty and worn, but it's also so much more colorful. The rainy sky that we see is a blue-green, dappled with thin clouds. Men's faces as they watch this confrontation are sunburnt and red. There are even drops of rain on William's face as the kid approached to finish him off. If I didn't see that Monko was the main artist on both of these books, I would not have guessed it. That's how different they look. The artwork here in Apache Skies is ages beyond what we see in Blaze of Glory, and I am so pleased to say that. The character of Cole Williams is not a historical Marvel figure, but the Apache Kid is. In the 1950s Atlas Comics, who would go on to become Marvel Comics, created the character, who was based on the real-world Apache Kid, an indigenous person named Haske Bey Ne Netyal. The real-life Apache Kid was freed from Yuma natives when he was a boy by the U.S. military. He then grew up, basically, as a part of the army, like a hanger-on or a street urchin. He was eventually enlisted and then served with the military for a time. The original, fictionalized Marvel version is very different to Ostrander's reimagining. The original kid that Marvel created was actually named Alan Crandall, and he was of Caucasian descent. After being orphaned, though, Alan was taken in by an Apache chief named Red Hawk and his wife, and was then raised by them. When he grew up, he took on the name Aloysius Care and fought outlaws. What makes the Apache Kid's comics stand out from the rest of the Western fair of the time is that his title gave equal weight to both the indigenous peoples and the whites. In his comic, neither race was perfectly innocent or totally evil. This was a big difference from contemporary comics of the time, which were often written by white men who grew up in the city and had little to no experience with indigenous cultures at all. The Apache Kid headlined his own title for 19 issues, finally falling back out of the leading role in 1956. What became of his story after that is unknown. He never appeared again. But, apparently, in the continuity of Apache Skies, he was shot in the back and killed. Why? By whom? And when? And who is this mystery woman avenging him? All good questions to start a book on. Elsewhere in the American West, a man called only McGee is thrown out of a bar into the muddy street. McGee pushes himself up, shouting that he shouldn't be treated this way. He's a dangerous man! But no one cares about his shouting. But someone cares about McGee. He circles the saloon that he was thrown out of, preparing to pee on the building. McGee giggles. <laughs> That'll show him. A gun is suddenly cocked behind his head. The man wielding the gun tells him not to move. This is Johnny Bart, the rawhide kid, and he was a friend of the Apache kid. In fact, 
He's looking for the men who killed him. McGee, eyes wide, says that it wasn't him. He swears it. Rawhide stares at him. That ain't what you said inside the bar. But the man that he wants is the man who set it up. A man named Billy Tyler. Where is he? Tyler went over to Texas, McGee says quickly. His daddy is a railroad man. He owns a town called Segoro. Rawhide pulls his gun back. Well, all right. If you behave, McGee, you'll live to be an old man. He turns away, suggesting that McGee put his member away before he sets the women to laughing. This insult sets McGee off. He draws his own pistol, shouting at Rawhide, but Rawhide quickly turns and fires. The bullet hits McGee in the chest, and he drops. Quote, Like I thought, McGee, you were just too stupid to live. End quote. Rawhide Kid was one of the few characters to survive Blaze of Glory, and this is indeed the same man. Ostrander kind of does this scene to show that Rawhide isn't a cold-blooded killer. He could kill McGee, but he spares him initially. It isn't until McGee draws on him that Rawhide fires, which makes it feel like Rawhide is a benevolent, self-protecting figure. But I would argue that Rawhide deliberately provoked McGee with that penis-sized joke. Rawhide went into this wanting to kill McGee, but he needed an excuse to do so, so he manufactured one. In Rawhide's defense, McGee did help to kill the Apache kid, so it isn't like his hands are clean. This also means that we have two people fighting to avenge the kid, our mysterious woman from our opening, and the Rawhide kid. We then jump to Las Cruces, Texas, where we meet William Tyler, the father of Billy Tyler. William is exactly what you expect of a railroad tycoon. He's white, portly, with a round face and a wide nose. His white hair is receding from his forehead, except for his excellent mutton chops. He's sucking on a cigar as he talks to Colonel Richard Trask. It seems that, yes, Billy did help to ambush and kill the Apache Kid. The kid had gotten Billy arrested once, and after his father paid to get him released, Billy wanted some revenge. Now, someone wants revenge on the people who killed the Apache kid, and William isn't willing to let his idiot son be one of their victims. Williams asks if Trask knows that one of the hunters is the rawhide kid. And well, that captures Trask's attention. William tells his ally that Billy is in Sagoro. He wants Trask and his ex-soldiers to go there, defend Billy, and kill those who are hunting him. He has a train waiting for Trask when he's ready. What if they're too late? Trask asks. William's face is hard. Then bring me the scalps of his killers. So this scene is mostly here to establish our villain, William, his muscle, represented by Trask and his soldiers, and then set them in the way of our heroes. We learn that William is pretty cold-hearted here. He outright says that his son is a disappointment. But he also has some amount of love for him. William did get him released from jail and is now sending people to protect him. So he might be a jerk, but he isn't totally lacking a heart. Trask gets very little detail here, but we do see that he is interested in the rawhide kid. Why, we aren't sure yet, but his involvement seems more critical to Trask than whatever Williams is paying him to do. But we also see that Trask understands how deadly Rawhide is. He asks what he should do if they're too late, implying that Rawhide might be fast enough or skilled enough to beat them to Sagoro and to Billy. Along those lines, we board the train at Sagoro and find the rawhide kid asking the porter, what's up with all the additional security? The porter, who is a black man, explains that Billy killed the guy, now someone's looking to kill Billy, and those men are here to protect him until his daddy comes to get him. Rawhide nods. Any idea who's doing the hunting? The porter smiles knowingly. Well, I do believe it's you. Now Rawhide bristles. I'm afraid you're mistaken. The porter shakes his head. No, sir. He worked the railway during the railroad wars, and he remembers Rawhide. He was a friend to them there, and he warns him that the sheriff of this town is not a friend. He introduces himself as Eustace Grimes, and then moves on. The protection for Billy Tyler moves through the train car next, stopping at Rawhide. 
A grisly, tough-looking man carrying a rifle asks Rawhide his name and for his ticket. Rawhide produces it, introducing himself as Jeb Kent. The man looks it over. Well, this seems to be in order. Says here you're headed to the end of the line. You getting off here at all? He asks. Not unless you're going to make me, Sheriff, Rawhide replies. The sheriff hands back the ticket. Nope. Once the sheriff passes on, the porter stops at Rawhide again. He tells him that the train slows down at a curve a few miles outside of town. You know, just in case you wanted to know that. Rawhide tips his hat and thanks Eustace. We then follow the sheriff off of the train. Another fellow asks him if he found anything, but the sheriff replies no. There was one man on board, but no woman dressed like a man. In the background, we see a figure carrying a large basket on their back exiting the train, and as the camera moves around them, we see that it's the woman from the start of the issue, grimacing. That night, once the train leaves, we do indeed see the rawhide kid leap from the train. He dusts himself off and makes his way back to Sagoro. In Sagoro, we find the woman looking through a spyglass at the town. After a short while, she spots her prey, Billy Tyler. She moves to her basket and opens it, pulling out the guns, coat, hat, and other accoutrements that she wore at the start of the issue. Several things then happen very quickly. We see Billy, drunk and confident in his safety, follow a woman out of the building. She's telling him, no, not in Main Street, and she sounds maybe a bit drunk herself, but Billy doesn't care. He owns... His daddy owns this town, he can do what he likes, and he wants to do her. The rawhide kid rides a horse back into town, urging it to be quiet. He starts to close in on Billy, and wow, lucky to just run into him right here, but mystery woman calls Billy out first. She goes through her Inigo Montoya speech, you killed the Apache kid, prepared to die. And then the sheriff shows up with a couple of men, warning her to back off. Billy encourages the sheriff to just shoot her, though. Hell, step back and he'll do it. Rawhide then appears behind Billy, pointing a gun at his head. Everyone just calm down. They can all walk away from this so long as no one does anything stupid. Which is when the woman shoots Billy in the stomach. Rawhide, now standing over his corpse, just looks at the body. Well, shit. The transition that we get into the scene is a bit awkward for me. We don't get any narration boxes or explanation for what is going on. You just need to be able to follow the images that you're presented with. The scene where Rawhide jumps from the train really confused me initially until I reread the scene, the dots connected, and then I was fine. You gotta pay attention to this comic book. There is no casual reading here, y'all. As you can see, there isn't really much of anything to make this a max comic, save for some adult language. That's enough for Marvel to justify the change in publication, but it really doesn't do much for me, personally. I'm used to my comics not having swears in them, so it's actually stranger for me to see them in a comic. They do allow for this pretty great comedic ending, which I appreciate, and it certainly escalated our story well. I thought that this miniseries was going to be about hunting Billy Tyler down and avenging the Apache Kid. Hey, but nope, we already did that. Billy's dead. And now we get to see what everyone else is going to do. Issue 2 picks up right where Issue 1 ended. Everyone is standing over the corpse of Billy Tyler, shocked. The sheriff swears and quietly says in shock, She shot him! Rawhide has his pistol out and he seems far less amazed. Yeah, well, let's not make it any worse than it already is, he says. The sheriff aims his gun at the woman, who stares at Billy's body with her eyes wide, and Rawhide draws a bead on the sheriff. Yeah, I thought you might say that. Things then escalate quickly from there. Rawhide opens fire, winging the sheriff and shooting two of the men before they can even get their own shots off. The bullet to do that passes through the woman's hair, and she barely reacts to it. The sheriff shouts for his men to kill them, and Rawhide drops another two of the sheriff's posse. The sheriff shakily aims at the woman, and Rawhide shoots his gun out of his hand. Finally, finally, Rawhide and the woman are the only two left standing. For the first time since shooting Billy, the woman, 
still in a daze, aims at Billy's body again and then empties her pistol into it. Rawhide snatches the clicking gun from her hand, telling her that killing him once was enough. He's already dead. But she grabs the gun back. It wasn't enough. Someone suddenly shouts that it's them. They turn to find the woman that Billy was, uh, wooing, last issue, leading an angry posse. Like, they have guns and pitchforks and torches and everything. They're a real mob. A real old-timey mob. Anyways, she shouts that they killed Billy, and now they killed the sheriff, too! A shoot him! As the crowd opens fire, Rawhide encourages the woman to get his stashed horse, which we saw last issue, and they run. They do get to the horse, and then they head to the stable, so that she can get one of her own. The woman who was with Billy helps the sheriff as he sits up, amazed that he's still alive. That gun hand, meaning Rawhide, chose his shots well, the sheriff says. He and his men are shot to shit, but they're all alive. Another man reports that Rawhide and the woman were seen going to the livery stable. Sheriff Wilson knows that they can't lose them. Old man William will burn the town to the ground if they escape. They need to surround it. But suddenly, the ground starts shaking. The pounding hooves of horses shakes the ground. Rawhide and the woman shout and scream, encouraging the herd of horses to keep running, each one of them on a horse of their own. The crowd of horses keeps any potential fighters back, and our heroes manage to ride it out of town. One lucky shot manages to catch Rawhide in his lower left back on the way out, though. Otherwise, they're safe. One of the men asks the sheriff if they should follow, but on what? He asks angrily. They just ran every damn horse out of town. We cut to Rawhide and the woman, who are still riding to freedom. She's the woman that Rawhide heard was avenging the Apache kid, right? Yeah, and he's the man that she heard was doing the same, and he has no right to do so. Dazi was her husband. Rawhide argues that he and the kid were friends, and he never heard the kid talk about a wife. Then maybe you aren't very good friends, she replies. Ooh. The rawhide kid suddenly drops from his saddle. Sorry, he says. <clears throat> Stopped a bullet back there, and it ain't agreeing with me much. The woman helps him up, and they head to some caves that she knows about. They start a fire, and she helps to bandage his wound, giving them a chance to talk. They basically introduce each other. The woman was called Rosa by the Mexicans, and she won't tell him her Apache name. She reports that his wound isn't bad, the bullet passed clean through. The rest of his assorted scars would indicate that he's used to this kind of thing. Rawhide puts his shirt back on, asking how Rosa planned to escape after killing Billy. And she didn't. Escaping didn't matter to her. You should always plan on living, Rawhide says just in case you do. She's moved over to the horse that she stole, petting its neck, and he compliments her. She has a good eye for horses. Of course she does, Rosa says. She always has. That's how she and Dazi met. She was trying to steal his horse. That was a pretty action-packed opening that would do any Western movie proud. Lots of shooting, running from the law, stealing horses, some strong character work. There is a part of me... Okay, here's the thing. One of my favorite authors, Rick Remender, did a writing thing a few years back where he would write the first issue of a new comic series, and then he would write the second issue. And then he would throw away the first script and rename issue two as issue one. He did this in order to move the story along faster, get the audience caught up on whatever was going on, and just, in general make the book more interesting. Reading this issue, I can't help but think that Ostrander could have done the same thing here. There is almost nothing from issue one that this issue doesn't give us. Rosa and Rawhide avenge the Apache kid against Billy, Billy's dad wants revenge for the death of Billy, and there's gonna be problems thanks to that. Add in some light exposition here, and honestly, we would be fine if this was issue one. Not that I'm saying that the pacing here is bad. Ostrander is providing us with everything we need in an even, well-paced manner, and it really works well. This is a strong single issue. 
We don't see a lot of character work being done here, but we do get some, and what we do get, I like. After Rosa killed Billy, she just stood there, staring at the corpse. I'm not sure if she was caught up in the horror of what she had done, or if she was feeling relief at having avenged her husband, or maybe she was just caught up in the rage of the moment. I kind of lean towards rage, because she goes on to empty her pistol into his already dead body, but I mean, she didn't do that to the gentleman that she killed last issue. Was Billy's role in the kid's death that much worse than that of the others? We also learn that vengeance was the only thing that she was living for at this point. Rawhide asks what her escape plan was, but then she replies that she didn't have one. She either thought that she would be killed doing this, or she didn't care if she lived once she had accomplished her goal. I do like the subtle bit we have with Rawhide not killing any of the lawmen, despite them being opposed to them. Rawhide is supposed to be a hero, and we see that demonstrated here by his mercy. Did he want to defend Rosa? Yes. Did he want to escape? Yes. But is he willing to murder carelessly in order to do those things? No. And I love that. It would be really easy, especially given that this is a Max comic, to just make Rawhide a cold-blooded killer, but no. He ain't the Punisher. Rawhide is a hero, and Ostrander makes sure to portray him as such. This also makes his shooting skills seem much more impressive, because he's shooting to disarm or wound and not kill. So that just makes him seem even cooler to me. Rosa is a new addition to the Apache Kid story, so she immediately goes into how they met. She relates her own origin and that her mother was an Anglo taken in by a raiding party. She died shortly after Rosa was born, and her father was killed by soldiers when she was young. Rosa was taken in, quote, by the whites, end quote, but she knew in her heart that she was an Apache. She ran away, found her people, and they welcomed her back. Despite their openness, Rosa always felt the need to prove herself so she would often dress like a man and steal ponies. Real quick interjection here, that origin should sound familiar, because it is basically the same origin that the Apache Kid has. A mixed child caught between the indigenous culture that they were raised in and the encroaching culture of the United States. But where Dazi fought to bridge these two cultures, Rosa does not seem interested. She is Apache and only Apache, and the whites are her enemies. One day, Rosa was going to steal some ponies, but she was snuck up upon in the woods and was tackled. Her attacker was defending his horses, and this was Dazi. When he tackles her, he is surprised to find that his thief is actually a woman. They tussle, ending with Dazi pinning her to the ground. There is a pause as they pant and look into each other's eyes, and then Dazi kisses her. He stands then, telling her to go. She's confused. She thought that she was his prisoner. Quote, I think, girl, that I am yours, Dazi tells her. End quote. He introduces himself and tells her not to come here and steal his ponies anymore. But if she wants to come and see him, well, that's fine. Rosa did steal his ponies. Dazi then tracked her and took his horses back. And then they got it on. And then they got married, by Goyathle himself, no less. But eventually, the Whites were encroaching too much on their territory, and Rosa wanted to ride with Goyathle's raiding party. Dazi did not. He could see that the Whites were here to stay. Fighting them would be futile. They need to find a way to coexist. But Rosa wouldn't hear of it. She had always felt the need to prove herself. And in this matter, she was an Apache first and foremost. Remember that history lesson that we had back at the beginning of issue one? The one that said that Goyathle avoided the American and Mexican militaries for a time? Rosa was with him for that. They were finally betrayed by other Apaches allied with General George Crook, and Dazi was among them. He found Rosa on their long march and tried to warn her. Billy Tyler was looking to kill Goyathle, and so he needed to escape. If Goyathle went to the reservation, as the treaty that he signed demanded, then he would surely die. But if he runs, then he will at least live. Dazi promised to be the one to take care of Tyler, 
if Rosa could trust him enough to warn Goyoth Lei. She did. And, for his part, Dazi kept his word. Tyler was arrested, but his father got him released. Tyler then killed Dazi, and the last things that Rosa said to him were so hurtful. She let him leave without a kiss or an embrace, nothing, thinking that she hated him. Rawhide explains that he knew Dazi as Al Kerr, and they were good friends. When he heard Al was dead, he started hunting his killers. He sighs. Looks like it's all ending. Geronimo, the Mexican name for Goyafle, surrendered again, and he's being taken to Fort Bowie. Rosa is outraged by this news. She's not going to let him languish in the hands of the White Devils. She must free him. Rawhide tries to talk reason, though. Al was right. Goyafle's time has passed. Rescuing him will only get her killed, and Al wouldn't want that. Rosa runs to her pony, shouting that what Dazi wanted doesn't matter. He's dead. She rides off, and Rawhide follows, muttering a curse. You got yourself one hell of a rattlesnake, he says to Al, promising that Al is going to owe him one for this. In Sagoro, Colonel Trask and his unit have finally arrived. Trask is dressed in all black, as are his men's, but they also wear black hoods over their faces. They are all armed to the teeth, and they do not look nice. Trask meets with the sheriff, who reports Billy's death and Rawhide's escape. Trask has his orders, so he shoots the man responsible for protecting Billy, the sheriff, in the head. And then his men burn Sigoro to the ground. The visual presentation of Rosa's story time is well done. Monko has largely used the good old comic standard of squares and rectangles to frame his panels in this book. But during her flashback, the panels are all jagged and torn. This makes them feel less real, like they're snippets of memories that are torn from Rosa's mind. They are also largely green, when the rest of the book is dark and brown and blue, which is also a great way of showing that this scene is so different. Monko does some really cool, handsome shots of Dazi, which makes sense. This is a memory of Rosa's, so we see her idealized memory of her lover. That is some great character work that is being portrayed through the artwork. I love it. I am not a very big fan of uh, Dazi and Rosa wrestling, and then he steals a kiss, and then her thinking that he has captured her, that, that he has possession of her. I will totally admit that I am not familiar with Apache culture, and I have no idea if this properly represents any aspect of them. My understanding is that every indigenous tribe has their own set of behaviors and culture, so making a blanketed statement about the Apaches is kind of impossible. Rosa even says that her father was Choconin Apache, which was a specific band of the Chiricahua Apache. I can't say how much research Ostrander did on Apache culture, but I know that my personal distaste comes from my modern sensibilities. The idea that you physically fight a woman and then pin her to the ground and then she belongs to you? Well, it just seems so archaic to me. It literally seems like something cavemen would do. But again, the culture that I grew up in is so far removed from the culture being portrayed here. And, to be fair, Dazi does release her. There is clearly a connection there, as he does invite her back, and it is fun to see that Rosa reciprocates by stealing his horses yet again. That's a cute way to establish that she likes him, sure, and she wants his attention, but she isn't going to just listen to him and do what he says. She's a spitfire. She's got her own energy going on, man. Or, like Rawhide says, she's a rattlesnake. So the flashback is pretty cute, until the reveal that Rosa was riding with Goyafle's party to the reservation. We learn that Dazi helped to capture them, although we aren't given details about how or why. Clearly, from his point of view, Dazi was trying to help. A prolonged hunt for Goyafle and his party would help no one in the long run, and it would only draw more ire from the United States military over time. But helping him get captured also feels bad to me. And clearly it bothered Rosa, who was very distant and cold to him. And this reveals why she was so intent on avenging him, because she feels guilty for emotionally abandoning Dazi. 
Yes, she was driven by a good old-fashioned old-school need for vengeance, but hers also has an extra layer to it. There's probably a little bit of self-hate going on, and this is why Rosa never planned beyond the murders. She might feel so much guilt for her hurtful words that she wants to die. And that is dramatic AF. That is good storytelling! Rawhide then reveals what our plot is going to be moving forward from here. After all, this book launched with the idea of avenging the Apache Kid, and Billy Tyler is dead. The Apache Kid is avenged. But now that Rosa knows that Goyafle is about to be imprisoned again, she won't stand for it. And knowing that Rosa isn't exactly in the most self-preservational mindset, Rawhide has to go along in order to keep her alive, if only to honor his friend. There is an oddly romantic tone to Rosa and Rawhide's scene in the cave before she leaves. Like, Rawhide is handsome and shirtless, and she's pressed up against him, and she's opening up about her past and sharing vulnerabilities. Like, it feels like Ostrander is setting these two up for some smooching, and I honestly just hope not. We just got to see this meet-cute between Rosa and Dazi, and she is so in love with him that she's gone on a murder spree, and now you just want to pivot all of that to Rawhide? Just, please, no. I'm not ready for that. Also, there is this weird thing where Rosa calls Rawhide by his stated name, as in Johnny Bart, one word. Which is silly, because Rosa knew who Billy Tyler was. She never said Billy Tyler as one word. It feels kind of like Ostrander is trying to give Rosa a bit of an ignorant, savage story element, but she is also clearly really intelligent and cunning, so this just feels super inconsistent to me. It is oddly endearing, like a pet name that she has for Rawhide, but that just enhances the feeling that they're going to end this story as a couple, and I just really don't want that. I suppose that it isn't bad by its very nature. Rosa can move on from her husband whenever she feels like she needs to. And too soon for me doesn't mean that it's too soon for her. (sighs) Anyway, enough about that. I could probably cry about how much I don't want this pairing to happen all day. Uh, We still have the ending with Trask and the burning of Sigoro to cover. Now, the Trask name is a familiar name in the Marvel Universe. Bolivar Trask was the inventor of the mutant hunting sentinels over in the X-Men books. However, there is nothing in our story to indicate a connection here, like there was for Fiskov being the ancestor of the Kingpin, Wilson Fisk, in Two Gun and the Sunset Riders. And this is a Western comic, so I fully expect Trask to be shot by the end of the story, so, you know, the odds of him having a kid, probably not too great right now. Anyways, Trask is clearly a cold-hearted Subanovich, because he murders the sheriff without a second thought, and then he orders his men to burn the whole town down. When William Tyler said to kill those responsible, boy, howdy did Tras take him seriously. He is clearly eager to impress his boss. And this shows us ultimately how dangerous Tras can be when threatening our leads. Trask won't stop with just killing him. Trask won't stop with just killing them. He will also kill anyone that he has to in order to do the job. This is a solid way of establishing the stakes and to make Trask feel evil. His men also wear hoods over their faces, like the Knight Riders that we saw in Blaze of Glory, but colored black instead of white. Is there a connection there? Quite possibly, but we don't really have a lot of background on these folks yet, so it's a bit hard to say. Overall, though, I still super enjoyed this comic. We got to know our cast better in our second issue. Rawhide feels like the same guy that we read about in Blaze of Glory, so that's beautifully consistent. And Rosa is a fun, unpredictable wild card of a character. And the whole book is flippin' gorgeous! So that is a big help for me. Next time, Rosa's journey to save Goyafle delivers unto her a new mission. And the Rawhide kid may be the only one who can keep her alive long enough to do it. Join me in a week for Comic Book Breakdown episode 19.6, the second part of Apache Skies. Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. 
If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening.